Welcome back to Open House uh, with Mark Seawick. And well, Corey Moran is not sitting in today, so let's just hope to God that this goes well. I got sitting in with me, um, my good friend. Um, and how long have you been together? 16 years? So 16, 17 years now. For those, is it 17? I think it's pushing 17. For those who don't know, this is Josh Bartolotta, uh, who's been with me for, as he just said, 17 years. Um, and it's been quite a ride, bud. Quite a ride. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great to have you. Um, why don't you tell everybody why it is that uh, you're sitting in today? So Corey just uh, welcomed a baby boy uh, into the world, his his uh, or their third child. So Can you believe uh, that, that Courtney gave birth on Saturday, and here it is Wednesday, and he opted not to actually do the podcast. I mean, knowing Corey, it, it almost is a little surprising that he's yeah, not I'm, sitting I'm, in this yeah, chair. I'm, I'm, honestly, I'm shocked. Um. <laughs> he he, I, I don't think he runs on water and food like most of us. Um, uh, but, the, but guy's, the guy's patient. Uh, yeah, um, he just, deserves a little time. Uh, unsurpassed. Yeah. How are you? How, how, how I'm are doing you well. Doing? Yeah, doing well. What's yeah. going on with you? Um, I, you know, I got two of my own that, that uh, keep me more than busy, a, a almost two-year-old and a four-year-old now. And um, yeah, between the kids and work and, and getting, out, getting, getting out and golfing a little bit, um, keep them busy. What did you do this weekend? Was, was it a lot of golfing? Golfed a little bit. Yeah, we cooked out with, uh, with family um, and just kind of enjoyed the, the last of summer before uh, school starts again. And, 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 and man, oh my God, like... Like a like a yeah Boom. like a snap. It's crazy how quick the summer went. Not only that, but then all of a sudden, like you know, all of a sudden, Labor Day arrives and fall immediately set in. Mm -hmm. Like there was no transition. There were years when we're enjoying just this sort of lingering summer that goes on and on and on throughout the month of September. Not this year. We've had 90s early September some years. I remember. Yeah, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. Not 60 degrees the other night l under l last year. Um, I was down in our place in Hammondsport. Uh, over the weekend, it got um, the overnight lows were in the high 40s. Yeah, sweatshirts were out, sweaters were out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is fun. I like the fall. Yeah, really awesome. So, all right. So, listen, as I said, just bear with me because I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So, um, I, I just literally I show up for this podcast every week. Corey's here, and then he just walks me through it. Um, and he's, yeah, I mean, of course, he was like, you know, one of the top rated DJs in the, in mm -hmm. the area, so he knows what he's doing. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing, so I'm just going to give him my You're going to kill it, I'm sure. So, yeah, so, all right, so let, let me tell you a little bit what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about economic news. There's a lot going on in terms of the economy and in terms of uh, some upcoming meetings with the Federal Reserve. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the fall market and what, what our anticipations are. Josh Sitzer, uh, he's the guy who um, initiated this lawsuit um, that resulted in the DOJ settlement with the National Association of Realtors. Um, some interesting news going on with him right now. Um, and then there's some things going on in terms of uh, national brokerages, um, some attrition uh, that is taking place. And it's going to be really interesting, I think, to dive into a little bit about what's going on and how it is that uh, that we may be offering something a little bit different with the, than what some of these national brokerages are. So, um, so, so normally, um, we sit down and we talk a little bit about what's going on in terms of the number of listings of the market for sale uh, this week versus last. We talk a little bit about how many pe uh, properties are currently pending. But as you saw earlier, did you get the, uh, the text message earlier? The MLS mm -hmm. is down. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so yeah, um, can't can't check that. But uh, you know, I think we can say that as is typically the case right after Labor Day, usually there's a, a nice little uptick in in listings. Um, I, I'm actually disappointed not to have this number, so we'll report on it next week mm -hmm. because. We have a meeting every Tuesday at 1.15. Um, and I actually, so we've got 15 properties going on the market for sale this week, next week, and the week following, we're anticipating another five or eight. So we're probably listing between 20, 25, maybe even 30 properties Crazy. this month. It, it is just insane. Um, what, tell me a little bit about what uh, the team was saying about uh, the competition and what our colleagues are experiencing. I, I, don't, I don't know that there's you know, that kind of energy elsewhere. Um, you know, as I just said a minute ago, I, I, usually there's an uptick yeah. in listings after Labor Day, but it, it doesn't seem, it, at least there isn't um, um, a, a open dialogue and discussion about uh, um, other agents having that kind of pipeline of listings forthcoming. So, you know, whether that's happening and it just is happening behind the scenes or, or maybe it just isn't happening, I, you know, I don't know. But it, it will be interesting, in, uh, you know, to get into the MLS and kind of see what's happening over the next week or two. Yeah, I, I did. Um, when we were sitting in the meeting yesterday, I did look and there were nine new properties in the market for sale yesterday. It's not a lot. Mm -hmm. um, today, tomorrow, Friday, I think it will be very, very telling. Um, we will we will know. Would you agree that we will know what's going on in terms of the month of September? Well, actually, you know what? We'll know by uh, by end of day on Friday, what is going to go on with listings for the months of September and October? Because if there's if there aren't a lot of listings on the market for sale, new listings on the market for sale by the end of the day on uh, Friday, 
we can anticipate that people aren't putting properties in the market for sale uh, over the course of the next few weeks because the preponderance, um, you know, and th th these these few days really set the uh, the tone and the mood uh, for the next uh, six eight weeks. Would you agree? I, I think so. I think I agree with that generally. Although I, I will say there there's a handful of sellers um, that I was speaking to, you know, two weeks a month ago th that you know were getting their houses ready to list, and the the conversation was happening about when to list after Labor Day, and and there was some discussion around waiting until the week after Labor Day because of okay. families being busy with kids getting in school and you know new routines yeah, kind of yeah. you know moving into place so I, I do think broadly that that's probably true that by the end of this week we're certainly going to have a precursor as to the way it's trending um, I definitely think next week so by the, um, end, of, by the end of the day of, of uh, a week from Friday definitely will tell us the story of okay. what the next two yeah. months are going to yeah. look like for sure and by the way can we just put it out there this market <laughs> The selling market for the year 2024 comes to an end in less than eight weeks. I am. Can't wait. I can't, <laughs> can't wait. I am just exhausted. I mean, I was just on vacation last week. It was just, it, 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 was, it was heavenly. It yeah. was really, really awesome. So, yeah. deservedly um, so. Let's talk a little bit about the economy. Um, there is so much going on. And so, there are so many statistics. And I think, um, let me just bullet some of what's been playing out over the course of the past few weeks in terms of national economy. Um, and then uh, maybe some projections about where it is that we're headed over the course of the next uh, uh, two weeks. So um, a really, really big number. The economy added 150,000 new jobs in the month of July. And that was, that was remarkable in that throughout most of 2023, we're adding 200,000 plus jobs mm -hmm. every single month, I think for 15 months consecutive. Um, that's a lot. And then for it to drop to 150,000 uh, in the month of July, it initially panicked the markets. The stock market dropped, plummeted mm -hmm. when this uh, was announced last month. Um, the, the, well, actually, up until yesterday, the stock market had really, really um, uh, uh, responded nicely, and it did come back. Um, so, so it, it, it counterintuitively, fewer number of jobs being created. That's actually really, really good because we had a red hot um, economy. Uh, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. Um, came in at 0.9% a few weeks ago. It was the first week since March of 2021 that that level came in below 3%, which was really great. Um, and then PCE came in just last week at 2.5%, just a smidge above um, the, uh, the Federal Reserve's target rate of 2%. So all that is really great. Um, disinflation has clearly set in. And so the, so the, the next big number is this Friday. Um, and this Friday, we're looking at employment numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, it's going to be interesting to see what plays out in terms of employment numbers. They are pre there are predicted 163,000 new jobs being created last month. If the number comes in below 163,000 uh, new jobs, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and be because it will be an indication that the economy has gone from inflation and that we're quickly heading toward a recession. So mm -hmm. do you want to talk a little bit about that and some of your thoughts? Uh, you know, there, there is a, that counterintuitive element to you know, the cooling of the economy, you know, being actually good for what's hap happening with, with rates. Um, but, but in terms of the cooling of the, of, of the economy, um, we've been talking about this for months about, you know, the Jerome Powell trying to navigate this soft landing, which, you know, has so many different elements to it yeah. and is so nuanced. Um, you know, let's hope that, uh, you know, job creation numbers come in at or above where, where they're projecting. Um, well, it, it is this Goldilocks sort of because too far below 163 and the market is going to flip out because mm -hmm. it shows that we're going into um, recession. Anything above that, the market's going to flip out because people are thinking, oh, my God, you know, we still have tamed we inflation, which is not going to be the case. But nevertheless, it really is this it's Goldilocks. It's a tightrope. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 you know, and until, until the next few months pass, I think it's just going to be this schizophrenia that plays mm -hmm. out in the part of economists and pundits and others where they're just trying to figure out, you know, what is the right figure. Um, interest rates, um, thirty-year mortgage. Did you see the latest rates? Yeah, six th six point three seven or something. Six point yeah, four, yeah, right around yeah, there. We've yeah. been kind of hovering around that for the last month or two. You know, I would say for the, um, for the past thirty days. Yeah, um, which is a full percentage point below where we were um, uh, just uh, just a short while ago. So that's yeah. been very very nice. Uh, 
the 18th of this month, the Federal Open Markets Committee is going to meet. And uh, the, the question, everybody, everybody is absolutely certain, and Jerome Powell has led people to believe that there's going to be a rate reduction that is going to be announced. Um, most people are think, thinking at this point in time it's going to be a half percentage point, I'm sorry, a quarter percentage point. Um, there is some conversation uh, that's playing out that it could be half a percentage point. We'll know a lot more come, uh, come Friday. Um, but when you look at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the Fed Watch, um, there's only a 30% possibility, according to the CME, um, that we're going to be uh, seeing a half point uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, lowering of, of rates. Where do you think they're headed? I mean, at the end of this year, where do you think we go? Uh, you know, I, I think that you're. I, I think that a ha I think that the likelihood of them of Jerome Powell dropping at a half point, given everything that we just outlined in terms of the the schizophrenia of of what you know they've been trying to navigate probably is unlikely. That feels like it almost would feel too risky to them um, to lower them that much. Um, I think a quarter of a point is probably like, likely. Um, and then who knows, by end of year, I mean, could we could we be around 6%, maybe even a little bit lower than 6%? You, you think by the end of the year, really? Wow. I think there's a possibility. I don't know that I, I don't know that I say what's likely, but I, I think that there's a possibility that we certainly could be around 6%, pretty close to 6%. Uh, from, from your lips. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm anticipating you know, six and a quarter, just a little bit below that. But I, but then again, I know that's just me uh, putting my finger. Yeah, in the I mean, same. Yeah, yeah exactly. same. I mean, we're all kind of speculating. So all right. So how do you think? So, so let, let's assume that over the course of the next two weeks, interest rates, which are at six point four percent or thereabouts right now, and as a result of the FOMC meeting on the eighteenth, we would you agree that before the end of this month, we're probably looking at uh, interest rates of uh, uh, thirty-year mortgage of six and a quarter. Would yeah, you, I yeah? think that that's likely. All right. How does that play out for buyers and sellers? <clears throat> I think that it. I think that it could move. Um, some sellers who have been sitting on the sidelines back into, you know, a, a more engaged um, approach to, to buying again. And I think it could bring uh, buyers that, um, you know, haven't been active in the market back in, into, you know, looking for homes um, to purchase. I also think that it could start to maybe, I think we're, we're starting to move in the direction of, of freeing up some inventory. And by that, I mean, for the last several years, uh, as rates have gone up, and a, a lot of home buyer or a lot of homeowners are are locked into interest rates at you know three percent, three point five percent, they've been sitting in their homes. You know, as you've yeah, discussed yeah, on yeah, this podcast yeah. a number of times, um, I think the lower the rates start to creep down, and, and the, the the more that gap between where current rates are and and where homeowners are locked in diminishes, I think that you know we might start to find more and more. Um, homeowners putting their houses on the market again, uh, you know, in, in, in search of that bigger house, the, you know, the, yeah, the, because, the, because families change <clears> over the time, time. So, you know, there are, there are people, as we say all the time, there are families that are larger that need more bedrooms. There are families that have downsized because kids have gone up to college. Families no longer need to buy bedrooms. You know, they, the mom and dad, you know, are ready to uh, downsize to a smaller home. So that's a possibility. I read a statistic earlier in the day that the average uh, mortgage at this point in time is uh, clocked in at 3.9%. So when you look at all mortgages throughout the United States right now, if we were to go back um, just a few years, I think the average was probably right around 3.5%. Mm -hmm. um, we're now at 3.9%. And that the more that that number creeps up, yep. um, the less the delta is between what it is that somebody's locked in at and what current rates are. And so that 3.9% is the highest it has been in four years. So I think your point is really, really well taken, which is, Let's just hope that that number continues to inch up a little bit, so that the delta and as interest rates are coming down, and as that uh, uh, slowly yeah, the delta really shrinks. Better. So, yeah. um, how do you think this is going to play out in terms of sellers? Um, you know, I, I think that it's, I think that there's some interesting nuance to this because you know the 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 obvious gut reaction is that affordability for buyers increases, interest rates go down, affordability goes up. Um, the ability for um, buyers to be more competitive in you know the 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 bidding war dynamics at least that are that are still pretty common um, or at least up until fairly recently were, were pretty common in Rochester. Um, you know I think that there's a high likelihood that that starts to become more predominant again. More buyers looking for houses. We still have relatively limited inventory in Rochester, although we're talking about it freeing up a little bit. Let's hope. Um, I think for sellers, by and large, it's going to mean if homes are prepared well and they're listed at the right price at the outset, 
that sellers can probably expect bidding wars again fairly commonly. Yeah. Um, and and you know we know what happens with with bidding wars. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think the sellers are going to crush it these next six seven weeks. Um, yeah. I, I think they're going to do very 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 well. Uh, but but again, the, the inventory you know it, it is an issue. Um, inventory levels. I mean, surprisingly, I wish I, I wish I had the numbers in front of me. But the inventory levels nationally are really starting to climb mm -hmm. pretty significantly. Um, inventory levels uh, up really, really um, uh, much more today than they were last year. Unfortunately, Rochester still is not enjoying any of that. Mm -hmm. Rochester still has this inventory problem, uh, which, according to you know the models that we're looking at, slowly starts to. Um, correct itself after the first of the year so yeah well and, and we're already seeing that I mean in terms of the team yep for um, sure Molly from the team was just saying in yesterday's meeting that we have more properties that we know are coming in the market for sale that we're gonna be listing for sale next year we know more today of what's gonna be playing out next year than we did um, uh, in December of, of, of 2023 so which is quite a statement at the beginning of September to already be saying that <laughs> yeah exactly so anyway all right so wait i gotta to talk to you a little bit about my friend nick mancuso who owns elevate jim you've not been to elevate yet i have not been to elevate i know nick fairly well but i have still have not been to elevate oh my god so so i'm, I'm planning on uh, once uh, once things slow down uh beginning of middle of um, october um, i'm gonna make sure that the entire team goes over there and um, we just tour the facilities because they're, they're, they're just unbelievable in fact i'm able to go there in about half an hour as soon as we're done here so um so um it, Elevate this incredible gym um, in Village Gate Square. Um, and what it is that, that uh, they've got me saying about Elevate is you can unlock your potential at Elevate where we where they blend luxury and functionality in a thriving fitness community. Uh, their expert team offers personalized training, dynamic group classes, and exclusive amenity, amenities like cold plunges and infrared saunas. I get to get back to my cold plunges. I can't imagine it, honestly. But you you said that you... it's, it's... And, and, and then we got so busy that I had to stop doing it, but... It's invigorating. It's it's more than invigorating. It was like I mean, my heart rate variability. Um, I wear this whoop here. My heart rate variability just skyrocketed twenty six percent the first time that I ever did a cold plunge. Unbelievable. So yeah. Um, anyway, it's it's just a great gym. So um, I'm starting to see everybody who has been exercising outside um, mm -hmm. over the course of the past few days. They're all starting to migrate indoors. Yep. Yeah, indeed. So, by the way, are you still playing tennis? A little bit. I mean, I, I don't get out near as much as I'd like to, um, and I miss it. I need to. I need to start playing again. I, I, golf has has sort of replaced a lot of the time that I used to play tennis. But you know, as my as my four year old gets older, I, I suspect that I'm probably going to be getting him out on the court I, a little I was, bit, I was which will be fun. Ask. Yeah, I'll get him out and start to teach him some lessons, and and hopefully he takes to it, and then that would be great. You know, I mean, the two of us was, could play, and that was your thing. It was a hundred percent my thing. Yeah, I used to teach tennis at, at Midtown for. Several years. Uh, yeah. I, I, I hope you get back to it. Yeah, I miss it. I yeah. will. Yeah. I will. Time, right. will. time will allow. You want to talk about John Sitzer? This is crazy. I don't even know where to start with this. <laughs> I mean, um, I mean, let, I, let's just start with... Right, let, let's see who is John Sitzer. Or Josh Sitzer. So, so Josh Sitzer, the Sitzer Burnett lawsuit. Yep. Um, I, I think by now most people have heard about you know the, the, the litigation that took place. Um, Josh Sitzer... It basically stemmed from from Josh, Josh Sitzer feeling like he was quote unquote bullied into paying a buyer's agent commission on the sale of his house in Kansas City. Yep, yep. And you know, fast forward what four years I think of litigation, um, and you know the DOJ um, did rule in their favor, yep. and there's some commission changes that have happened. Yep. Um, you know, buyer agency agreements now need to be signed, all, right. all of that. So what does this guy do? What um, does this fool do? So Josh Sitzer had, in my opinion, I, you know, I'm just going to say it. Uh, he had the audacity to partner up with two of his buddies and try to monetize real estate agents <laughs> after he just, you know, after he just sort of slapped everybody in the face who practices oh, real estate. I mean, that's probably, like, that's, it soft, and that's probably putting it politely. <laughs> Um, Come on, I, if it gets with the letter F, let's just put it out yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, I, I won't go there. It's your podcast, but, <laughs> but um, yeah, so he, he and his buddies have, should we just jump into it? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah please, he, yeah. He and his, his, his buddies have, have founded this company called Landian. Yep. And Landian, you know, broad strokes, what Landian is going to um, try to offer is an a la carte um, 
brokerage. Real Broker. estate service. It's not yeah. a brokerage. They're not calling themselves a brokerage, but they're they're going to rely on licensed real estate agents who are holding their licenses yeah. at brokerages yeah. to offer a la carte services to anybody in the public who wants to utilize such services. It, it's it's crazy. It's uh, it's it blows it, it, my it, mind. It's, it's it's can we just put it out there? It's a failed business model. I, there, there's zero chance that this succeeds. Zero. So, so, all right. So, there are, there are two reasons from my perspective. Um, why don't you state the obvious? Um, you know, his ability. Go ahead. I, I mean, I, I think there's a number of reasons. Um, I, I mean, we started with it in the beginning. I, you know, after trying to do this on the heels of what just happened, um, in terms of the lawsuit that he filed and the the slap in the face, to put it kindly, that that. Anyone practicing real estate around the country, you know, has felt as a result of of this litigation. You know that that's putting the obvious out there. But you know, for, for other reasons. Um, well, I, 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 I think what you're saying is he's got to rely on licensed real estate agents for his business model to succeed. So he's he's opening in 50 states throughout the country, and he's saying to these age and he's saying to prospective sellers. Yes, I have a network of real estate agents that I am going to rely on who are going to help you to sell your house. Correct. So he would need buy-in from a ton of real estate professionals in all 50 states around the country to buy into this model, number one. And then number two, and to me, this is as much of an issue, if not more, he also needs buy-in from the brokerages because yeah. he, they're not a brokerage. Yeah. So he needs brokerages to not only encourage but allow their agents yeah. yep. to offer well, these a la carte services with the brokerage taking all of the liability yes. on yeah. if anything were to happen in these transactions, yeah. what brokerage is going to allow their agents to do this even if agents wanted to do it? Well, well so, so, so let's go back to uh, the first one. What intelligent agent with any spine is going to get a phone call from Josh Sitzer and his company and say, oh yeah, you're the guy who just screwed over the entire real estate industry. Sure, I'd love to partner with you and I'd love to take $250 and meet with a prospective seller, secure signatures, put it, uh, uh, go ahead and take photos of the interior property and put it all into the, multi all into the multiple listing service. For two hundred and fifty dollars, are you kidding? Like this guy is a, a joke. It's it's so mis it's so misguided. Um, it, 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 you know, I, I mean, not only I mean, just just putting aside for a second the the dynamic that now exists between real estate agents and Josh Sitzer, yeah. um, it, it's such a dumbing down of what agents do, well, well, it, what it, agents it, offer. You know, to the I mean, it's kind of the point you were just making. Uh, you know, I, I think he's offering. I think they want to offer. Um, a fifty dollar flat fee for agents to conduct a showing, and I think they want to offer uh, one ninety nine. I think it was to they call it prepare a purchase offer. Right. You and I both know there's so much that goes into showing prospective buyers through homes and preparing a client to even be ready to make an offer, let alone just walking through the actual filling out and signing I of mean, a six-page you know, purchase contract. You can fill out a six-page purchase offer. That's perfectly fine, but you're not serving the client all that well. Um, and so much of what we do, um, when I've got six offers in front of me, I need to know, I, I, and, and let's say three of them come in at the same price. I'm going to go with the agent that I know is going to deliver. And there are agents in town that when their offer comes through and they're, they're equal to everybody else, I actually will tell my clients, we can't work with this particular offer because this agent works almost exclusively with Zillow leads. Mm -hmm. And a Zillow lead just has inherent to the, the, the way that this uh, buyer is coming into the market. Um, it, 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 those are always problem contracts. So, I, 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 and you're speaking to, to relationships a yeah, little bit, right? Th thank the you. relationship yes. between a, a buyer and their representative yeah. is is vital right. um, because you, you a it's vital to, to the buyer, I think, and it, it, it's a part of the problem with this whole arrangement that that Sitzer is trying to to create with with Landian. You know, Redfin kind of tried this, you know, for several years, yep, this yep, flat yep. fee model, yep, you know, yep. a little different than what than what he's doing. But, you know, essentially this flat fee model where, you know, somebody would just 
randomly call Joe Schmo off the street, an agent, but no relationship whatsoever, no rapport, no trust, yeah. you know, none of that. And Redfin was struggling like crazy to get offers accepted because of that which you're speaking to, you, which you, is... You, you can't just fill out the contract. You've got to make sure that you're taking your client by the hand and making sure that they are qualified by a mortgage broker and that they understand how much cash you're gonna have to come with out of pocket. You've gotta make sure that your client understands and is having an engineer's inspection conducted. I mean, yeah, an agent can't just fill, I mean, you know, I could just go on and on. Um, so it's, but then, the, then there's also the whole issue of quality control. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you've got this national, he's, he's trying to start a national company, all 50 states. How is it that you can, you can control because the only agents who are going to do this, if any, are going to be agents who are desperate for business. And if you're desperate brand for new. business, they're either brand new or they've been doing it for 20 years and they're just mm -hmm. terrible, lousy, shitty agents. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, e even if they were great agents, the, the, Q, uh, the, the QC is going to be very, very difficult. Um, but, the, but you layer on top of that the fact that these are going to be just bottom of the barrel agents who are going to be conducting this kind of, it, it's just a business model. So, and a I mean, lot of the reaction that I've seen to this is, alludes to, to what we're talking about, which is even if they get some agents, like the agents you're describing, the yeah. brand new agents, or the agents on the back end of their careers that are just trying to, they're never gonna get their offers accepted. No, no, so no, no, these no. buyers are gonna be spinning these wheels, yeah. and then what do you think happens as buyers are paying a flat fee over and over yeah. and over again for every showing, for every offer they have to write, they're probably gonna end up paying more money than they would have paid if they just paid a commission in the first place, I, I, right? I, I, it's, it's just it's, the whole thing is, is I mean, get, get, get insane. Out your, get out your champagne. It's I mean, crazy. Like, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll be celebrating the death of this guy's business. It's, it's very, just crazy. Very soon. So, all right, do you want to talk about one more thing? We got a few more minutes. Let's do it. All right. Um, I think this is really, really fascinating. Over the course of the past year, you're starting to see uh, large real estate brokerages starting to lose agents due to and as a result of attrition. Um, Remax has lost six percent of all their uh, of all their agents nationally. Keller Williams. 9%. You can go through a list, um, uh, Real, uh, Real, which is a, a broker, a, a, a holding company for several brokerages, um, including Caldwell Bank or Century 21. They're also um, losing money. Uh, or losing agents, I should say. Um, it's fascinating if you start to, to dive down and look at some of the reasons. Um, and these reasons include increased competition from low-cost brokerages, they're citing that, I don't necessarily buy into it. Difficult market. Mm -hmm. I think we would both agree that that's for one sure. of the reasons. The DOJ ruling, um, I think, is sure. causing a lot of agents to leave. Um, but also, they cite the fact that agents aren't as wed to or committed to uh, relying on the brand name of the brokerage that they're associated with because increasingly, agents are becoming brands in and of themselves. And we'll talk about these all in just one moment. Um, and then finally, technology. And mm -hmm. agents are looking for greater technology. So, which of these do you want to do? You want to because uh, I want to then segue into like the companies that are actually starting to see an increase. So, which which of these do you want to talk about? I got. I mean, I, I think uh, I think a lot of them, you know, ha ha carry a lot of validity with them. I, I think that the the increasing um, brand creation that that agents are are um, investing themselves in on their own is 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 really paramount in the discussion probably. I mean, the, the reliance upon the, the brand name of the brokerage, I, I don't even know that that's recent. Maybe it's, it's, maybe it's, it's um, more, um, more predominant recently, but I think for a while, at least the top agents, the top agents have always been brands in and of themselves, you know, I feel I, like. I disagree with that. I mean, yeah. I, I think that for the longest while, it was Holly, and then it was Holly and me. And then over the course of the past, I think, six years, eight years, then you're starting to see other names starting to emerge. I mean, like, well, I, you know, you go back, it would be Doreen. Doreen had a really mm -hmm. big name, obviously. Um, you know, and now you're looking at, um, you know, guys like Anthony Butera or Susan Glenz, mm -hmm. um, who are really starting to make names for themselves. So I think this has been more of a recent trend. But do you feel like, do you feel like <clears throat> consumers hired agents because of... The brokerage they worked at. Oh, you, you know what? I, I see. I see what the difference is here. I, I'm much older than you. <laughs> it's really what it comes down to. So I've been doing this for 34 <laughs> years. You've been doing it for half that amount of time. So the answer to that question is yes. 
Like people would, when, when being interviewed, what brokerage are you with? I'm with um, Keller, I, I'm with um, uh, Nathaniel. Oh, okay, great, then I will hire you. But people just would, would hire the brand. And, and, and then, it's, so for, for a long while, I would have to say, but there are 650 agents who are associated with Nathaniel. So simply because somebody is associated with Nathaniel doesn't mean that they're good. I mean, you've got great Nathaniel agents and you've got terrible Nathaniel agents. So I would have to try and talk to people about the fact that it doesn't matter what the brokerage is. That's really interesting. What really matters is what is the quality of and what is the track record of. And I think that has changed so dramatically over the course of the past few years. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, because when I, when I said initially that I, I think it's, you know, maybe more predominant now than ever. I mean, for the last 10 years, I would say for me personally, I can't, I could probably count on two hands the amount of time somebody's asked me what brokerage I work for. Wow, that's great. That's, uh, I, you know, so you, I mean, to, to my point, yeah. I, you know, I, I think, so it's interesting to hear from, from your perspective, you know, not to date you, yeah. but it's, it's interesting to hear that that was a, a, a common question. I, I mean, that, you know, and that, there were all these small brokerages, um, you know, uh, Mitch Pearson was like, you know, a powerhouse. Like if you were mm -hmm. associated with Mitch Pearson, Judy, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, yeah, Judy Columbus, Judy Columbus uh, you know, yeah. like huge, Gar Lowen goes. I yeah. mean, these were, and if you were associated with a particular They carried a weight in the- They carried weight Well, I remember when Nathanagel, I mean, I remember before, when Nathanagel was Nathanagel before they became Hard Hannah. I mean, I even even when we were there, I, you know, I, Nathanagel certainly carried a, a gravitas with it, for sure. Well, absolutely, and when, when Howard Hannah bought Nathanagel, I mean, oh my God, people were in mourning. I mean, mm -hmm. people were wearing black, you know, like there was, because that was a home. It was one of the institutions. It was, it was there was a Rochester based. And so anyway, so, so that is one of the reasons um, mm -hmm. that, uh, that these brokerages are suffering is that agents are becoming um, entities and brands in and of themselves. So let me go through um, uh, increased competition from lowest cost brokerage. We can, you know, th that makes a little bit of sense to me. Difficult market, that definitely makes sense yeah, to both. Sure. Dow, uh, the, the Department of Justice ruling, Agents leaving the business, definitely. And then I, I, I just want to touch on technology and say technology really does seem to make sense because as I'm reading some of these journal articles, there are a few companies, um, real brokerage. And if you think about a company like Surhant, they are offering two things that I think some of these other companies aren't offering. One is really state-of-the-art marketing and two is technology. So we've got some great brokerages and I'm not here to shit on any of these other brokerages, but um, if you look at Howard Hanna, their technology and their marketing. Dinosaurs. Is, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I was going to be nice, but, but, but the reality yeah. is, you know, and, and not to be unkind, but they're still marketing real estate as is, 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 it's the year 1995. Yep. And, you know, they've got their flip phones and their Blackberries. And, you know, it, just in terms of technology, they haven't kept up. And if you think about, you know, even the, the national brands, the local Re, uh, the Remax offices, if you think about um, even Keller Williams, I mean, Gary Keller for years. And one of the reasons that we originally went over to, you know, you introduced me mm -hmm. to Susan Glenn's. Yeah. And we went over to um, Keller Williams because Gary Keller just kept saying, we are a technology company that just happens to sell real estate. And year after year after year after year, he repeats the same thing. Do you think that they have great technology? I mean, certainly that, certainly not that, it, certainly if, if it's there, I don't think that a lot of people are tapping into it. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I mean, it's hard to know, but uh, you know, I mean, to, to the point that you're making, I, I think that more and more as agents are becoming brands in and of themselves, or, or you know, uh, embarking upon the effort to become brands in and of themselves, the the ability to be forward thinking and to innovate and to do podcasts like this, to yeah. um, you know, to do video. You know, we've talked about video a lot yeah. on podcasts previously. Well, um, yeah, you, you just did, you know, a, property a, videos, a, a, a great video yeah, the other day you. that was really, really well received. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, to, to, to not only now it's not enough just to be out on social media. Now it's, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing to keep people's interests? What are you doing yeah. to engage people yeah. um, in fun ways, in different ways, um, you know, ways that separate you from the, the thousands of other agents, uh, you know, and our, for us, it's 3,500 agents or so. And in some cities it's, New York, there's what, 10,000, 20,000 yeah, agents, yeah, yeah. you know, it, you, you need to do something to differentiate yourself. And if you're fortunate enough to hold your license at a brokerage that helps you do those things, yeah. you know, a la probably a lot of the, the more boutique kind of brokerages these days yeah. that are doing that, I you know, mean, you mentioned Sir Hant, look what you're saying. doing, look what we're doing right now. Yeah. Um, you know, if the big shops, the Remaxes, the Keller Williams, the, you know, um, 
you know, whatever brokerage you want to name around the country, don't start to, you know, to try to help their agents do this kind of stuff. I think more and more the trends that, you know, you, you mentioned at the beginning in terms of, of agents potentially leaving these larger, these larger brokerages is, is probably going to continue. Yeah, I mean, evolve or die. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be really, really interesting to see whether or not these large brokerages are going to be able to pivot over the course of the next few years. I mean, it's, if you watch um, the latest season of the Sirhan Owning Manhattan. Love it. I, I, honestly, like, I don't buy into that stuff because I just don't have time. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to watch it. I, that's the one reality television series that I do watch because I actually do pick up on things that Sir Hant is doing. And there's nobody that does better marketing than nobody. Sir Hant as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that guy he's, is he's brilliant. And, and so, you know, so the reason that we went from a podcast to a video podcast, the reason that we do the videos that we do, the reason that I uh, write this blog that is read by, you know, 12, 15, 20,000 people every single month um, is because we're just trying to do it differently and trying to do better, and I think consumers are expecting more. So anyway, mm -hmm. anything else before we uh, we part company? Uh, no, this was fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah, th thanks for you're you're you're, you're a great uh, co-host, um, and and hopefully I did okay, Corey. I, I I know I couldn't run the show like like Corey does, and you you had to step in and take Corey's I, role, which I think you did pretty well. I didn't do too bad. I think you did right? pretty well. Do you think do you think Corey's I, I, I'm not going to say he feels like his job is in jeopardy, but I, but I think you did a good job. Yeah, he, 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 he's, you know, he, he could feel a little threatened. He, he let's, may. Let's, we'll, he we'll, may. We'll, we'll be I nice think he'll be all right. Days. All right. Um, listen, <laughs> uh, thanks so much for listening. Where's the camera? Oh, where, where, where's the camera? There's the camera. Um, thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for watching. Um, if you have questions or concerns in regard to real estate, you know what? Uh, Josh, tell us a little bit about how, how people can reach you. Um, I, you can reach me uh, myself, 545-9004. And uh, we look forward to seeing you back uh, next week, Corey. Uh, take care until then.